Psychologist Stanley Kipner is here with me today to talk about the spiritual crisis emergency of Gen Zs. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Kipner to The Stand with Pavlina. Uh, Dr. Kipner is a renowned psychologist with spirituality transforming experiences. He has spent numerous years educating and training mental health professionals. Kipner is a pioneer in the study of consciousness, having conducted research for over 50 years in areas of dreams, hypnosis, disassociation. He's conducted workshops all across the world, written dozens of books and articles in the recent years. Dr. Kipner, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate you coming on. So firstly, what is a spiritual crisis, emergency, and how is it affecting Generation Z? Of course, in psychology, we see people changing behavior all the time. And psychotherapy is a deliberate attempt to change people's behavior and thinking patterns so that they function better in the world and have more joy out of life. However, there are some experiences where attitudes, thoughts, and behavior are changed by themselves, sometimes suddenly, sometimes gradually. And this can be done in a number of ways through relationships, through economics, through uh, moving from one part of the world to the other. But sometimes it's more of an inner change, and we call this spiritual if it addresses important, overriding, basic existential issues in life. So I've had a special interest in spiritual transformation because this is something that most psychotherapists don't aim for. Mm -hmm. It's sort of out of their realm and it's often very, very private. And what is one person's spirituality might not be another person's spirituality. So over the years, I've collected a number of spiritually transformative experiences and I've written on the topic as have other of my friends and so this is sort of a special interest of mine. I totally get why, because it's some, when I first learned about it, when I first kind of like, you know, saw what it was, the first thing I thought was existentialism. I was like, that's what it sounds like to me. It seems like everyone's just, you know, struggling with a little bit of an existential crisis, but it also has a lot more to do with it. So Gen Zs, um, they've had a difficult time so far, and so have millennials. Uh, it's just been a struggle for these last two generations, but they're also the largest Gen Zs are the largest and youngest generation. And most are seeking mental health. A lot of them are seeking that, seeking that during our time. But based on your experience with researching those who have had life altering shifts, what do you see as the problem for the future of Gen Z's? Well, you're absolutely right. We are living in very difficult times, mm -hmm. not only globally, but nationally and even domestically. Many people are cloistered at home for the first time in their lives since they became adults. They are forced to cope with people around them, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes being this close to a person has negative effects and negative transformations. <clears throat> Sometimes being so close to people has positive transformations. So I think that having one spiritual center is pretty much of a anchor for these turbulent times. And if one has got a viable worldview, what I call a personal myth, one is able to navigate more easily and more closely, whether it's with people with whom one is cloistered or with oneself or with the world at large. Now, mm -hmm. now, when we use the word spiritual, again, we're talking about user existential. Yes, an existential theme is important in spirituality. Yeah. And existentialism deals with core issues and values, matters of life and death, matters of romance, of making a living, of relationships. So we don't talk about trivial things when we use the word spiritual transformation. To go a step further, uh, some of your listeners might take down the website My Mythos, M-Y-M-Y-T-H-O-S, where my collaborator, City and Morningstar, is laying out a program for young adults to identify their personal myths. 
and to have sort of a core belief system that can help them navigate in these difficult times. Now I can go much further than that, but that's the overview. Yes, okay, so I wanna talk a little bit more about these personal belief systems. Can you like dive a little deeper into that? Yes, yeah, so when I use the word personal myth, I use that instead of personal belief because a belief is something very intellectual. A myth is something that's very holistic. It not only involves what one thinks and one believes, it involves what one does, how one behaves, how one feels. Emotions are very important for personal myths. Feelings are very important. Relationships are very important. So it goes beyond just a belief. It's a whole package, you might say. And as you might suspect, one person's belief system, one person's myth is very, very different than another person's personal myth. And sometimes these come into conflict, especially if people are living together as they are in these difficult times and they discover disagreements, fractures in the relationship that they were not aware of before. So it's important to know where one stands and judge one's decisions and behaviors from that point of view. I suppose I could give you an example. In these cloistered relationships, sometimes a couple began to abuse each other and insult each other. They get on each other's nerves and this leads to a real fissure in the relationship. Something that was not obvious before because they didn't spend that much time together. But now that they're spending virtually 24 hours a day together, that relationship can get closer or it can start to fall apart. These are some of the issues involved and this is why it's important to know where one stands, how malleable one is. Sometimes one's personal myth can shift a little bit to accommodate what another person's myth system is. Sometimes it's sort of irreconcilable and living together brings these fractures, these disruptions of the relationship to the surface. So this is what we are often dealing with. Same thing goes with parent-child relationships. Sometimes children feel abused and some of them actually are abused. They get on their parents' nerves, and instead of understanding the child, establishing a relationship, the parent finds it's easy just to ignore, or worse yet, to punish the child in some way. And there are already cases of where these fissures in relationships have led to suicides, not only of young people, but of one partner or another partner. So we're dealing with really critical issues here that are due to the shutdown and the social isolation. And the antidote for this is to be very sure what your grounding is, how flexible or inflexible your grounding is, and how this is affecting your relationship with the people with whom you are cloistered. Yeah, the pandemic has caused so many issues for so many people because of those reasons, you know, like whether it's family dynamics or relationship dynamics, um, what are some steps that Gen Z's can take for mental stability? Mental stability, of course, is important just as long as it does, does not become rigid. Okay. One of the problems with personal myths is that they can become very, very rigid and there is no compromise. Mm -hmm. And so when two people are living together, if you have very, very rigid belief systems, very, very rigorous personal myths, there's going to be a clash and sometimes the clash is not a very happy one. Maybe there can be a flexibility. Maybe they can work out a way that they can live together. An obvious example, of course, is the political situation. You might have one partner who's a Trump supporter, another person who's a Biden supporter, and in everyday life, that doesn't matter too much. They can each go their own way, vote their own way, but when they are watching the same program on television, making comments about it, then some of these disagreements are going to come to the future, come to the uh, surface and the future of the relationship might be imperiled. So it's almost as if one has to adopt a strategy in terms of live and let love. Well, I'll respect your choice. You have to respect my choice. And maybe we can have a civilized dialogue about our differences that'll make the conflict interesting and profitable rather than leading to a rupture in our relationship.
So how is 2020 different for us with how mental health issues and how we deal with them? Not all difficulties in relationships that come about in the social clustering are really mental health issues. Right. Some are simply problems in living that people face every day of their lives if they live a complex relationship in a complex society as we certainly are living in. However, they become mental health issues when they become constant and predominate over a person's waking thoughts and behavior, when they disrupt a person's sleep patterns, when they disrupt a person's general health in terms of uh, affecting their diet, affecting their uh, digestion, what we call psychosomatic problems. These are, the, these are the symptoms. Yes, you're facing a really mental health issue here. Or when a person begins to withdraw, becomes dissociative, deals with the fantasy world rather than the actual world. Or when a person goes through mood swings, very euphoric one moment, very depressed another moment. Yes, these are some signs of very serious mental health issues, which of course really demand counseling or psychotherapy which now of course is available through what's called teletherapy, where you can talk to a therapist or a counselor virtually and the results can be just as positive as if you were talking to that therapist face to face. There's been a considerable research on this already in this early stages because some therapists have been doing this for years. And I know therapists who have had, had telephone clients that they've never met face to face for years. It's worked out well. Now more therapists are finding themselves having to do this. And any one of your listeners can consult your local mental health association to get names of people in the area who are trusted and licensed counselors or psychotherapists. So I want to switch gears a little bit just because I really want to talk about soul exhaustion with you. So first of all, what is the first, so what are the first signs of soul exhaustion and how can someone dealing with that help themselves, I guess, with, with that? Yeah. Oh, that's a good term. Well, soul exhaustion, you can reframe that in a number of ways. Uh, when we talk about soul or spirit, we're talking about the very essence of a person. And for a person to function when one's everyday life, one has to have the basic energy to do things done, to maintain relationships, to go to work, <coughs> to attend to one's personal needs. The sign of soul exhaustion, from my experience, one begins to drop <coughs> and forget basic functions. One forgets to eat meals, for example. One finds it too much of a problem to answer the phone, let the phone ring. One neglects to uh, accept visits from friends, even virtual visits on, on Zoom or on Skype. So this is a sign that they don't have them enough energy for taking care of their own needs or to interact with other people. Those are the two basic symptoms of soul exhaustion as far as I'm concerned, where a person just doesn't have it together. They can no longer attend to even the most minimal things they usually do. Too much trouble to fix a meal so they easier to starve or to have a quick fix from fast food, not mm -hmm. nourishing food. Sometimes the person has insomnia as a result of soul exhaustion and doesn't know how to get to sleep, and are exhausted the next day. Sometimes a person just doesn't have it together to relate to the person they're living with or people who phone in or Zoom in, and it's just too much trouble even for a relationship to be maintained. So exhaustion can be spiritual, as we just talked about, but it can also play a role in how a person feels one can have physical exhaustion, one can have mental exhaustion, and more often than not, they trace back to soul exhaustion because something in one's personal myth, something in one's worldview 
no longer is working for them. And this can be so serious that they have to seek a psychotherapist or a counselor, or it can be something that they can work through themselves by contemplation, by meditation, by prayer, or by simple dialogue with trusted friends and neighbors and family members. Of course. So how is that? Because it feels like it has a lot of the same uh, symptoms as depression. So how, how is soul exhaustion different from depression then? I would say that soul exhaustion is much harder to treat than depression, okay. ordinary depression. Oh yeah, soul exhaustion, uh, one of the symptoms of, of course is depression. Mm -hmm. But ordinarily, if somebody is depressed, one can snap out of it by minimal contact with friends and loved ones, watching a funny movie, uh, taking up a hobby. Um, some people, believe it or not, are taking up knitting as a result of the social isolation. Right. Some people are using jigsaw puzzles. Some people taking gardening. Yes, these are things that pull a person out of ordinary depression. But spiritual depression, soul depression, uh, well, that's something much more serious. This goes back to one's basic existential worldview, one's basic spiritual grounding, and requires a much more in-depth treatment. Gen Zs, uh, for the most part, don't really have, you know, they weren't really instilled with religious, like with a strong religious background. Um, instead, it was, you know, childhood for Gen Z and millennial, millennials to succeed. Is that a reason for why there's, you know, turmoil today in, with people understanding our, like our place in life? Well, I would say so. I think that You've just hit upon something very important. In our society, a lot of attention is paid to success. People feel that they need to succeed, that family members need to succeed, that partners need to succeed. And for what? For what purpose? It makes them feel worthwhile. Well, maybe there are other ways that they can feel worthwhile. Maybe it can feel worthwhile in a relationship, even with a pet. This is where pets are so useful and handy. And especially in the time of social isolation, a dog, a cat, a bird, even a fish can be anchors for a person that uh, they didn't realize was as important as it is now. So I think that if you want to have an in-depth understanding of the role that success plays and the price we pay for it, read a book by Christopher Ryan, Civilized to Death. In that book, he talks about the perils of modern civilization and how it's driving people over the cliff because they're putting too much emphasis on externals, on external success. And it's actually doing them in. It's producing mental illness. It's producing family disruptions. And this is all part of the soul exhaustion that you mentioned a moment ago. No, I think that's a really good point. I'm going to check out that book for sure because I think it would be something that um, I know I'm definitely interested in and I know a lot of my friends would, would also be interested in that. Well, Dr. Kipner, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I re it really was a pleasure talking with you and I'd love to talk with you again soon. Well, these are very important issues and I'm so happy that you're paying attention to them. And I know your listeners will benefit from these discussions.